soils. You're going to get a lot of global soil data sets here. Vegetation mapping. If you're interested in vegetation, okay? So again, this ORNL DAC is this kind of L4 level products that have already been processed. It's not the raw data. You're getting these already analyzed data where someone has already done all of this analysis to get certain indexes for very specific questions. Next, the Socioeconomic Data and Application Center. Again, this was one of my favorites. I use this a lot for my dissertation. All of this data is spatial. So we, there's a lot of data that we can get, but it's not spatial. It doesn't have, you can't put it in GIS and see it in the globe and where, where the value is. What's great about spatial data is you can put it in the globe, put it on a map, and see where the values, how the values are related around the world or in your study area. So again, this is all social data. Well, here's the digital elevation data collection as well here. Environmental sustainability indicators. These might be really important for trying to predict which countries might be best at conserving certain resources. Energy infrastructure. So this is where we're really getting into the ecosystem services type stuff because it's human-centered data. How do our natural resources relate to our certain social variables? Population density, GDP, strength, government strength, conservation efforts. How much of the land is conserved? How well do governments do at enforcing certain environmental laws? You can find a lot of that data here. And you can relate it to the, the certain natural measurements that you might have and answer really important questions about how human interactions and human government structures or social structures are influencing our natural resources. Okay, that's ecosystem services in a lot of ways. Here's the gridded population of the world data set that I used a lot. So this is going to give you population data in a raster format in different resolutions and a, a, a few different time scales. So we go to the data sets, demographic characteristics. So not only the number of people, but what is the age of the population? How many men versus how many women? And here are the dates that they have. 2010, Here's estimates up to 2020, so they can predict population growth up to 2020. So there's a lot of cool data here. And I, uh, rec I recommend you explore these sites and look for certain data sets that you might need. Yeah. Yes, question, I'm coming. Uh, I find these sources very interesting and my question was uh, of course you mentioned the question of accuracy and my question is how do they calibrate this data? How are they validated? At least for the ones you have used for SEDAC and others mm. uh, you might know. Yeah, very good question. So the question is about accuracy and calibration. How do they calibrate these data? And the answer is, each one is different. Okay? And you have to go into the data sets and read about them. There's going to be a lot of documentation about them. Okay? And it's going to tell you, uh, is there a publication talking about this data? Um, changes that have been made to the data? What are the revisions that have been made? Okay, and you're going to find all this information. How did they get the data? 
which equations did they use to calculate the data, and if they did any calibration or accuracy testing. Okay, you'll find all, they, all of these data sources should have documentation like this. Okay, and it'll describe these questions that you've asked. How accurate is it? How did they come up with the numbers? And you might come up with four different data sets that all say that they're doing the same thing. And you may have to, you may have to um, either explore all four of them or decide based on the metadata, this one has the qualities that I want and that these other three don't. Okay? But you really have to get in and decide which one or which several are likely to be useful for your study and your needs. And that comes up a lot. And when you go to publish, uh, reviewers will ask these same questions. Why did you use this data set? And if you don't provide any justification for the data set that you used, they're going to ask you about it. And they're going to say, why didn't you use this other data set that is available? And so you'd have to come up with a good answer. I use this data set because in my region, there's more validation sampling points. So it's more accurate for my region. Or this other data set didn't have the years, that I'm, the time that I was interested in. OK? There's, there's ways to justify it, but you have, and none of, them's perf none of them are perfect. All of these are kind of abstractions of reality, right? They're, they're not perfect, none of them. But they're the best, in some cases, the best that we have. But that was a very good question. We always have to be thinking about accuracy and calibration and whether or not this data is really the best for me and my question. Okay, so those were US-based data sets. Although they're based in the US, they're available globally, many of them. So you can look through those data sets and, and find something you need. This is a local organization. Is anybody familiar with this? Yes, okay. Good, because I wasn't before. Um, and it seems to be a good data source for some of these variables that we're interested in. I haven't been able to successfully extract data sets yet, and I've emailed the administrators, and Amalie has as well, um, and so hopefully we're, we'll kind of figure out maybe if there's an issue with the data, but they do have maps that you can download that are already made, um, and there's a link to MODIS data, but let's take a look at some of the data sets that they have. Most of this is from East Africa, and East and Southern Africa. So here's Malawi land cover 1990, different schemes. So they have different ways of classifying the land cover. Swaziland, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Sudan, Namibia, Lesotho. You can search by raster or you can search by vector. You can search different categories. Do you want biological data in raster format? It says there's two of them. Maybe it will show me what they are. Or maybe they're vector, okay. Kenya, invasive species points. Madagascar, seagrass extent. Okay, so you, maybe you'll find a certain habitat type that you're interested in in your study area that it's already available here. Again, Amelie and I have tried to download some of these data sets and it didn't work very well. Uh, we're not sure why, but in the future, that issue might be fixed and you might be able to access this data more easily. So just keep an eye on this data set as well. I'm, I'm sorry, on this uh, website. So they have lots of different data sets. They have already done maps for most of the data. So a map is data that doesn't have any 
geography locators on it. It doesn't have metadata. It's a nice organized paper that has the map and it has the legend and it's basically used for displaying data in like a, a PDF or in a document. Okay, that's the difference between a map and the actual data set. And worst case, you can geo-reference the map and you digitize it yourself. Yes, so Amelie said in the worst case, you can take a map, download it, and geo-reference it. We haven't talked about that, but there is a way in QGIS to take a data set that doesn't have any ge geography information. So you find it in a book. You find a map in a book. You take a picture of it. You can load it into QGIS, and they have an application where you can say, this point is here, this point is here, this point is here, and it gives geography information for the whole data set. And it lines it up where it needs to be. So if you can't find the digital data, and you do find data in a publication or in a book, there is a way to get that into QGIS and have it aligned where it needs to be. Just so you know, we don't have time to cover that, but just so you know, that is a possibility. This is uh, another US-based website, but as you can see, it, it covers the world, and it's specifically related to drought monitoring. So if you're interested in different vegetation indices, uh, it has a lot of precipitation indices, evapotranspiration indices, drought tolerance, and you can select, as you can see, by the region that you're interested in. And it'll give you these different data sets. This, I'm not sure if we can read these. Rainfall accumulation. Here's MODIS, vegetation indices. So you see a lot of the same data coming up in different places, right? Especially things like MODIS, land cover, and the vegetation indices. Uh, monthly soil moisture. So if you're interested in drought monitoring, anything to do with vegetation uh, drought indices, this is a good place to find that. Choose your time. Here they have a strange time metric, the decad. So it's every 10 days. So the first decad is January 1 to 10. The second decad is January 10 to 20. I don't know why they do that, but <laughs> you, can, you can figure it out based on uh, you know, the calendar. World Climb. World Climb is another great free global data set that specific, has specific climate and biometric variables. Okay, so if you're interested in certain habitat mapping or biodiversity mapping, you can use these data sets. These are raster data sets in different resolutions and different time periods. So you can download mean temperature, annual precipitation, precipitation of the wettest month, precipitation of the driest month. These are really popular variables used to, measure, to, to map habitats. So if you have a certain plant species, you know it's actually going to live according to a certain set of climate variables. It can't live where it's too cold, it can't live where it's too hot, it needs a certain amount of rain, and that's all going to be in this data. So you can use this data to show what is the range of that species. So getting, for instance, uh, for Tanzania, the annual precipitation. This is from World Klim. Okay, and this is the number of raster cells that have a specific value. So most of it is around a thousand millimeters a year. Some areas, this is uh, uh, Kilimanjaro, right? High mountain area has a lot more rain. Okay, so we know that this is a certain habitat type here based only on the rainfall. 
or the temperature? Oops. These are a lot of other different data sources that we don't have time to go over all of them and you guys can explore again. You already have this presentation on your data stick so you can visit these sites anytime you want. Um, there's the UN Environment Program has a lot of good geo data. There's uh, Earth Explorer, USGS Earth Explorer is another one where you can search specific parts of the globe and search specific data sets and find the data that you need. That's really good for digital elevation models. Okay, the Earth Explorer. Natural Earth, we're gonna use that in our exercise today. Really simple ways to represent the Earth in small data sets. Not great for analyses, but good ways to reference your study sites and show where, where everything is located. Simple global and national data sets for certain countries. Population numbers, political boundaries. A lot of times you need these shape files in your analyses because you want to cut out, I'm only interested in the town of Arusha. So I can find the municipality of Arusha, the boundary, and I can extract the data from that boundary. Species occurrence data sets. Here's GBIF. There's a lot of other ones specific for herpetology or for ornithology. Okay, if you want to show where certain species are located on the map, then you can use these data sets. So what do you think? Do you think you can find the data that you need? There's a lot of data out there, right? And the access points are getting much better. Five, ten years ago, it was difficult to find all of this data. You had to go through a lot of different websites and sometimes it wasn't even available. You had to special request it. They're doing a really good job of making a lot of this data available and it's getting better. So I encourage you to explore these websites and look for certain data sets that you need. That's what a lot of this is. It's just spending a lot of time sifting through data and doing searches and seeing what comes up. Any questions? So we have about 10 minutes. Um, when we come back, I want to hit the ground running with this analysis, okay? Because we only have maybe an hour and a half and then Amelie's going to take over. So I want to really try to get as much time on QGIS as possible. Uh, so please, maybe in the last 10 minutes, um, make sure QGIS is running. Make sure you let us know if you have any issues and uh, we'll be ready to go when we come back from lunch. But for the next 10 minutes, I don't know if we want to have a discussion about this. If you guys have any issues that you've come across with data access, data preparation. Like what, is, what is the most pressing issue that you guys have found? Has it been finding the data? Has it been processing the data? A little bit of both? Yeah. Okay. Also applying it to your context. Yeah. Right. I need a particular shape file and I need to locate my species here and there. So yes. Yeah. So putting the data in context. How to how to actually use the data for what we what we really want. And so hopefully through the next and we should reiterate over the next 10 days, we're going to be doing a lot of this stuff over and over again. So today is just the first day. Tomorrow we're going to be spending all day again with GIS, okay, and spatial data, right? So we're going to be getting more and more comfortable with it. And we're going to be learning all the different ways that we can use the data and manipulate the data for what we need. Today, it might take some time to get you know, an initial level of confidence that you feel comfortable kind of navigating QGIS. But with time, we're gonna practice, we're gonna learn what's possible, and you're gonna see the world is gonna 
open up. You're going to see what's possible. And you're going to realize that the analysis that you want to do is definitely possible. And you can do it with the data that you have and the skills that you have. Okay, a lot of times it's just a matter of simply learning those initial steps, getting comfortable with the program, and spending time figuring out how everything works. So we're going to try to do that as much as we can over the next 10 days.